Hello, and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. In the last two episodes, we talked about the War of the Austrian Succession, or at least the main part of it. This war started in 1740 when Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI died, leaving the Habsburg family's lands and titles to his daughter, Maria Theresa. Other European rulers took advantage of the fact that Maria Theresa was female, and many of her lands and titles were supposed to be inherited only by men. Most notably, Frederick II, later known as Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, a small but militarily powerful state in northeast Germany, invaded Maria Theresa's lands in Silesia, a region in modern-day Poland. This invasion opened the floodgates, and soon all of Europe was engulfed in war. But by 1745, Maria Theresa has managed to make peace with Frederick at the cost of letting him keep Silesia. She's also managed to get her husband, Ferdinand, elected as Holy Roman Emperor, and he's basically her puppet, so all her lands in Germany are safe. But war continues against the Spanish in northern Italy and against the French in the Austrian Netherlands, which is basically modern-day Belgium. The British and Dutch, meanwhile, continue to fight against the French and the Spanish on the Austrian side. In the last two episodes, we also looked at some ways the war spilled over outside of continental Europe. The English and Spanish had already been at war beforehand in the War of Jenkins' Ear, part of their ongoing struggle for supremacy in the Caribbean. And in 1745, the French-backed Jacobite Rebellion threatened to overthrow King George II of England in favor of a less popular rival, James Francis Edward Stuart. Where we left off, this effort had failed. In this episode, I want to talk about some more ways that the War of Austrian Succession would ripple around the world. See, the French and the British both have large empires at this time. Now that they're directly at war, they aren't just fighting in Europe. In North America, the two sides clash in a conflict that will come to be known as King George's War. In India, they face off in the First Carnatic War. Both of these wars will have huge implications for world history at least as important as anything that happens in Europe during the War of the Austrian Succession. After we've covered North America and India, I'll quickly discuss the rest of the war in Europe, but what I will really want to talk about is something called the Diplomatic Revolution, a realignment of Europe's alliances that would happen in the war's aftermath. You don't need to listen to the last two episodes to understand what happens in this one. But those episodes do provide a lot of context that helps explain why the things that happen in this episode happen. So start here if you wish, or go on back to Prussian Roulette Part 1 for the entire backstory. Let's start with the campaign in North America, King George's War. Now, before I dig into the history, it's important to understand what North America looks like in the 1740s. If you were to look at a European-made map in 1744, it would look like the French are masters of North America. They claim vast territories from the Hudson Bay in the north, south through the Great Lakes and the Mississippi Valley, and down to the Gulf of Mexico. They also rule the city of Quebec and all of the St. Lawrence River Valley, along with the eastern seaboard of modern-day Canada, stretching as far south as modern-day Maine. Compared to that, the Spanish control Florida and the British controlled 13 colonies cover only the eastern seaboard of the modern day U.S., from Georgia to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They also control the southern part of modern day Nova Scotia. All of this 
is sparsely populated. The 13 colonies have fewer than a million inhabitants, with those in Nova Scotia pushing the British population just over a million. Much of the land that now makes up the East Coast states is still occupied by Native American tribes. Today, the U.S. East Coast has well over 100 million inhabitants, a hundred times as many people. So you can imagine how spread out the population is. Outside of farming communities and slave plantations in the southern states, most of the population is centered in the coastal trade cities. But if the 13 colonies are sparsely populated, New France might as well be the moon. Well, it's not quite fair. There are plenty of Native Americans living in the areas claimed by France, and many of these people would have been surprised to hear that some pale-faced king across the oceans claims the right to their land. But the population of European colonists in New France is vanishingly small. We're talking about a total of around 44,000 people. In the 1740s, the city of New Orleans is a small trading post with less than 3,000 inhabitants, and it won't even be a factor in this war. The bulk of the French population is centered around the city of Quebec, and the surrounding St. Lawrence River Valley. This valley connects French seagoing ships with inland fur traders that range as far as Minnesota and the western Great Lakes. France makes good money from the trade, but it's not exactly a manpower-intensive business. Moreover, the French have taken a laissez-faire approach to colonization rather than actively encouraging it. Contrast this with the British approach. Right? Exile to the colonies has become standard practice for British political and religious dissidents. The first Europeans to colonize New England are the Puritans, a religious group that thinks the Church of England is too close to Catholicism. There is an active push to populate the British colonies, which is why you see such a big difference in population. This doesn't tell the whole story, though. For one thing, this North American conflict we call King George's War won't be a battle of all 13 colonies in Nova Scotia against all of New France. The war is mostly fought on Nova Scotia, in Acadia, which is the modern-day Canadian province of New Brunswick, and in New England. So we're talking about 400,000 or so New Englanders against most of New France. But that's not all. The French population is heavier armed. There are few women and almost as few children and as many, many soldiers. Of the 44,000 or so inhabitants, 19th century American author Samuel Gardner Drake tells us that between 10,000 and 13,000 are capable of fighting. That is a pretty large proportion of the population. By comparison, the British colonists are mostly ordinary families. In a pinch, they could probably field more men, but the colonial fighting forces are local militias. They'll want to stay home during a war and protect their families, so it's tough to organize them into a real army. There are some regular troops present as well, but we're talking about a couple thousand each for the French and the British. Both countries are very busy in Europe right now. They don't have a whole lot to spend on securing some sparsely populated colonies in North America. In addition, the French and British colonists have made separate alliances with local Native American tribes. The British Crown has friendly relations with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, better known as the Iroquois Confederacy. And while I did a whole episode using these people's proper name, in this episode I will defer to historical convention and call them the Iroquois. 
The French, meanwhile, have allied with the Wabanaki Confederacy, known to Europeans as the Algonquians because they speak the Algonquian language group. This is politically expedient for the Iroquois and Algonquians as well. They're historical rivals from before the Europeans even showed up. And now the European colonists have been bringing in modern gunpowder weapons, which has kicked off a North American arms race between the Native American tribes. And by allying with rival European powers, the Iroquois and the Algonquians are getting access to the weapons they need to protect themselves from each other. Once again, though, the French have a hidden advantage. The Algonquians are far more numerous than the Iroquois, and they are actually willing to fight. The Iroquois have fought against the French in the past, but at this point they're only willing to trade with the British, not do any actual fighting. As a matter of fact, some individual groups of Iroquois living in French-controlled territory will even fight on the French side, so... When it comes to Native American allies, the French have a big edge here. Now, Britain gets involved in this big European conflict, the War of the Austrian Succession, starting in 1742. But while France and Britain are on opposite sides of the war in Europe, they aren't formally at war with each other until French King Louis XV declares war on Great Britain in March of 1744. When France declares war, it gives their colonists in the New World a bit of a head start. See, while word is still traveling to the British Admiralty, who will have to dispatch messengers to the colonies to warn them, French ships sail straight to the fortress of Louisbourg, located on an island north of the British-held part of Nova Scotia. The message arrives on May 3, 1744, nearly a month before the news of the war would reach the colonists in New England. A word on geography here. The Canadian province we now know as Nova Scotia consists of a peninsula that juts into the Atlantic, along with several islands to its north. At this time in 1744, the British only control the peninsula. Their people in Nova Scotia are cut off from the people in New England by the Canadian mainland, and this whole area, both modern-day Nova Scotia and the mainland area between it and New England, this whole combined area has a name. It's called Acadia, and not long ago the French had owned all of it. The British have only held peninsular Nova Scotia since 1710, a generation earlier, and most of the European population in the area is still French. The Native American population is also Algonquian-speaking, meaning they're friendly to the French. The only actual British on the island are a few hundred British regular soldiers and not more than a few thousand settlers. So, this is a logical place for the French to strike. It has a friendly local population. And on May 23rd, a combined force of around 600 French Marines and Acadian militia attacked the British settlement at Canso on the northeast coast of the Nova Scotia Peninsula. They're accompanied by an unknown number of Native American militia, although if Samuel Gardner Drake is to be believed, there may be as many as 500 of them. The 100 or so British defenders have only a makeshift wooden fort, and after a short bombardment, they surrender. Only two people are actually killed in the fighting, one on each side, with around 10 total wounded. The surrender is also quite civil. The men are taken as prisoners to the French headquarters at Louisbourg. The women and children are sent to Boston on civilian vessels. And the fortifications, such as they are, are burned down. This opening move by the French is just a raid. But 
This raid is the first the British colonists learn that they're at war. And the first news actually reaches Boston from a fishing ship. See, New England sailors routinely fish off the Nova Scotia coast, and the sailors on this ship had seen the smoke from the bombardment, and they sailed right back to Boston to tell Governor William Shirley what they'd seen. Now, William Shirley is a British lawyer who's only been in charge of Massachusetts for less than three years, although he spent ten years as a lawyer in Boston before becoming governor. Apparently, he was pretty controversial at the time because Samuel Gardner Drake spends an entire chapter of his book defending the guy. The long and short of it is that Shirley's predecessor was corrupt and nearly bankrupted the colony of Massachusetts. So, Shirley has been forced to strictly enforce tax laws while simultaneously spending less money. And because of those cutbacks, Massachusetts, by far the most populous British colony in the North Atlantic, is not prepared for war even though Shirley knew this had to be coming sooner or later. In fact, Massachusetts is only able to survive the war by printing paper money, and as we'll see, by virtue of generous financial donations from patriotic citizens. None of this is really Shirley's fault, though. He hasn't been governor all that long, and he's been working hard to fix an untenable financial situation. At the same time, there are a number of smart things that he does for which he deserves credit. And one of these things that Shirley deserves credit for is sending supplies to Annapolis Royal, better known by its old name, Port Royal, the British capital in Nova Scotia. He correctly judges that the French will try to retake all of their old Acadian land before they do anything else, like attack New England. The attack on Annapolis Royale comes on July 12, 1744. Initially, the attackers aren't even French military. They're a mix of local Acadians and Algonquian-speaking Native Americans. They outnumber the defenders by about 300 to 100, but on July 16th, four days into the siege, 70 volunteers from Boston arrive to relieve the defenders, and the attackers are forced to withdraw. By the way, the attackers are led by a French priest named Jean-Louis Le Loutre, a guy who becomes the leader of the unofficial Acadian resistance. Meanwhile, the defenders are led by the British governor of Nova Scotia, a man named Jean-Paul Mascarene. And if that name sounds French to you, you would be right. Mascarene was born in Brittany in 1684. But a year later, French King Louis XIV would expel French Protestants from the country, and Mascarene's family is Protestant. So... Mascaran has actually been raised in Switzerland prior to joining the British Army as a junior officer and working his way up, and the fact that he speaks French as his first language is one of the main reasons he's put in charge of this area with all these French-speaking subjects. So you can see how things are more complicated than where you were born or what language you speak. In... All the reading I've done on the war in Europe, I haven't seen any sources talk about religion as a major issue, for example. Unless you count the Jacobite Rebellion, but here in North America, you will actually see things like people in Massachusetts calling men to war to beat back the threat of Catholic domination. So there are complicated issues at play here in the New World. Anyway, the 70-man relief force is successful, and Jean-Louis Le Loutre pulls his militia back. And the two sides face off until September 6th, when François Dupont du Vivier, the Marine commander who had led the raid on Conso, arrives with 200 more men. They 
link up with Le Lutre's force and other local native and militia groups, forming an army of between 600 and 700 men in total. After Jean-Paul Mascarin refuses a French offer to accept his surrender, the French surround Annapolis Royale and lay siege. Duvivier is expecting a naval force to arrive with more support, while Mascarin is hoping for more reinforcements from Boston. The British reinforcements arrive first, except they're not really British. This is a roughly 50-man Native American force led by Captain John Gorham, and they show up on September 26th. A few days later, they launch a sneak attack on one of the camps of the French Native American allies and slaughter everyone, including women and children. And this brutality causes many of the Algonquian-speaking Native Americans to retreat. And without their help, Duvivier and Le Loutre are also forced to pull back, and the British remain in control of the Nova Scotia Peninsula. Unable to seize Nova Scotia by force, the French instead turn to raiding the British colonies, using their Native American proxies to wage a frontier war from Maine through New England and as far west as Saratoga, New York, west of Albany. In his book, A Particular History of the Five Years French and Indian War in New England, Samuel Gardner Drake gives us a partial list of the raids. He writes, and I apologize for inevitably butchering some of these names, quote, March 16th, Chevalier de Niverville, officer, and Sir Groschen Rambolt, cadet, left this town with some Abenaki Indians on their way towards Boston and returned with some scalps and prisoners, one of whom he took with his own hand. Sir Duplessis, Jr., an officer, started at the same time with six Algonquins and Nepissinnings in the same direction and joined the preceding party with whom he returned, bringing in a prisoner who was captured at the same time. April 20th, a party of 14 Iroquois belonging to the Salt St. Louis, commanded by Antasago, the son of the Grand Chief of that village, who sojourned at Fort St. Frederick and made several scouts to Satrasogo, Saratoga. The Ganakoesin, an Iroquois of the Salt, left with two Indians of that village to go to war near Boston. They returned with two prisoners and some scalps. Thessaoten, the chief of the Sauk, left with 22 warriors belonging to that village to make war in the direction of Boston. They returned with some scalps. One Iroquois was killed and two wounded of the party. Ganingoten, a chief of a party of eight Iroquois belonging to the Salt, set out in the direction of Boston and returned with two scalps. April 26th, a party of 35 Iroquois warriors belonging to the Salt set out. They have been in the neighborhood of Orange, Albany, and have made some prisoners and taken some scalps. A party of 20 Abenakis of Misakui set out towards Boston and bought in some prisoners and scalps. April 27th, a party of six Iroquois of the Salt St. Louis struck a blow in the neighborhood of Orange. Unquote. That is just March 16th to the end of April 1745, and it is just a partial list of the raids. And these raids will go on and on till the end of the war. And like I said, Drake's list is only partial. But I left off at the beginning of May 1745 because something else happens around that time. The British take the fight to the French and attack the French fort at Louisbourg. The British assault on Louisbourg is a long time coming, and it's a big deal. At the time, the French call Louisbourg the Gibraltar of the New World, and it's an impressive fortification. The stone walls are 30 feet high, and it sits inside the harbor on Cape Breton Island, the main island north of the Nova Scotia Peninsula, just uh, a few miles out into the Atlantic. This is France's only port on the North American Atlantic coast. 
the rest of their ports are inland in the St. Lawrence River Valley. And more importantly, Louisburg is a haven for privateers. And these privateers can sail out from there and shut down New England shipping with impunity. The fortress itself is protected by two artillery batteries, one on the opposite side of the harbor and another on the island in the middle of the harbor. Try to sail directly up to the fort and you'll be between the guns on the wall and the guns on the island. Try to go around the north side of the island to the far side of the harbor and work your way around, well, then the guns on the far north shore will hit you. This is a great defensive position. And being as it's a haven for privateers, it's a valuable target, but the British consider it too strong a position to attack. However, in September of 1744, shortly after his failure to take the fortress at Annapolis Royale, French commander Francois Dupont du Vivier had released the British captives he had taken from the Conso raid, and he returned them back to Boston. And one of these captives, a Lieutenant John Bradstreet, had personally reported the condition of the Louisbourg Fortress to William Shirley. And Bradstreet tells Shirley that the fortress at Louisbourg is undermanned. It has only 600 defenders, and the local area has enough population to raise less than 2,000 militia to augment that. There aren't as many cannons as there should be in any of the batteries, and despite the fact that Louisbourg had only completed construction a few years earlier in 1740, there are already two breaches where part of the wall has collapsed. William Shirley is now convinced that attacking Louisbourg is worth the risk. So in January 1745, he convenes a special meeting of the Massachusetts Assembly and asks for funding for an expedition. After a few days of consideration, the Assembly refuses. But during that time, word has leaked out that Shirley is planning an expedition, and some leading businessmen in the community offer to fund it instead. The assembly reconsiders the matter of the expedition and approves it, so long as the merchants agree to cover the bulk of the expenses, which they're happy to do. Right again, Louisbourg is full of pirates, and French pirates are damaging the merchants' trade, so it's worth it to them to fund an expedition to put an end to this. As a matter of fact, command of the expedition is even given to one of the leading merchants, a man named William Pepperell. In his book, The Colonial Wars, 1689 to 1762, American historian Howard H. Peckham writes, quote, Shirley had written to England asking for naval support from Commodore Peter Warren in the West Indies. He also issued a call for help from neighboring colonies as far south as Pennsylvania. All kinds of shipping would be needed. Command of the expedition was given to William Pepperell, 49-year-old president of the Massachusetts Council, militia colonel, and a prosperous merchant of Kittery in Maine. He was distinguished for good sense rather than for military experience. He was also popular, a primary requisite. As men and ships assembled in Boston, the enterprise gained something of the air of a crusade in the wake of the recent religious revival. It was supported by the clergy, for was it not directed against the popish French, those instigators of devilish Indian raids? Connecticut sent 500 men under Colonel Roger Walcott, who was made second in command. New Hampshire contributed 450 men under Colonel Samuel Moore. In the Massachusetts and Maine district, 3,000 men were raised, and both Vaughn and Bradstreet took commissions. Rhode Island sent only an armed ship. New York gave 10 cannon, 24 pounders, bringing to 34 the number of cannon available. 
Pennsylvania and New Jersey offered provisions. Altogether, 15 armed vessels and 100 transports were made ready. Down in Philadelphia, a skeptical Benjamin Franklin wrote to his brother in Boston, Fortified not towns are hard nuts to crack, and your teeth are not accustomed to it. Taking strong places is a particular trade which you have taken up without serving an apprenticeship to it. Full of enthusiasm and self-confidence, the expedition began embarking on March 24th. A week later, Governor Shirley received the encouraging word from Commodore Warren that he was on his way north with three naval ships to cooperate with the New England forces. Warren was 42 years old and had lived in New York City. He owned Greenwich Village since 1730. He was also married to a Delancey. The transports began arriving in Conso after April 1st. On the 23rd, to everyone's joy, Warren appeared in a 60-gun ship, accompanied by three 40-gun ships. The Connecticut Regiment and its own transport fleet arrived the next day. We have all the help now that we expect, one diarist concluded succinctly. Unquote. At the end of April, the British colonial fleet sets sail, and they arrive off the coast of Louisbourg the following day on May 1st. They're able to establish a beachhead south of the fort that same day, with only minimal skirmishing and resistance from the defenders. All told, the British force measures over 4,000 strong, against fewer than 2,400 French defenders, nearly 1,800 of them militiamen who have hastily rushed to their posts. However, the fortress isn't vulnerable from the south. This is just a good place to land. The harbor is north of the city, and to the south of it is a lot of marshland. But 400 men under Lieutenant Colonel William Vaughn are sent around the harbor and the marsh all the way around to conduct reconnaissance on the battery on the far side. They attack a small village there and burn down some houses, but they avoid any direct contact with the enemy. And on the morning of the 2nd, the area is eerily silent. Vaughn and his men move forward, anticipating an ambush, but when they get to the artillery battery, they find it empty. See, overnight, the French have spiked their guns and returned to the fortress. Uh, apparently, they thought they were outnumbered. Now, there are 30 spiked guns in this battery, and that's about it. Spiking, by the way, is the practice of hammering a big metal spike through the touch hole on the top of the cannon where you would normally light the fuse. This renders the cannon inoperable, at least until it's gotten a lot of attention from an experienced craftsman. And the British colonists have brought several skilled New England craftsmen with them for that very purpose. So when the French realize their mistake and try to retake the battery on May 4th, expecting only infantry resistance, they are faced with close-range grape shot from a few repaired cannons, and they are forced to pull back. A few days after that, Commodore Warren's fleet captures an incoming French supply ship, further worsening the defender's position. So, one of the two French batteries is out of commission, but the one on the island in the middle of the harbor, defending the direct approach to the city, well, that one is still very much in good condition. That's okay. Pepperell has his men drag smaller cannons across the marsh to the south of Louisbourg and up onto some hills overlooking the north and west of the fort, where they can fire down onto it from relative safety. At the same time, he orders men to haul more cannons to the north shore of the harbor, to the battery which his men have taken over, right? And he positions them there to deal with the French guns on the island. But it's tedious work, so... While they're hauling these cannons all the way around the harbor, the British try storming the island instead. And Howard H. Peckham writes, quote, 
Around to the east side of the harbor at Lighthouse Point, a new battery was prepared to fire directly on the Ireland battery. Hauling cannon around to it was a tedious job, so two attempts were made to storm the island. The first, involving some 800 men on May 23rd, never got started, as too many showed up drunk. A council of war exonerated the officers, but called for volunteers for a second attempt. About 400 agreed to participate on the night of May 26th. They made an undetected landing on the island. Then, some drunken fool proposed a cheer to mark their safe arrival. The noise alerted the French, who killed 60 and captured 119. The others escaped, but the bungled business depressed the army. Unquote. Instead of trying a third amphibious assault, Paparel decides to wait for his artillery to get in place, which they finally do on June 10th. And within a few days, they have demolished the French guns on the island, freeing up the approach to the fortress of Louisbourg proper. On June 15th, five days later, the army starts building scaling ladders, and Commodore Warren gives a speech proclaiming that he's ready to sail into the harbor and bombard the fortress directly. But before any attack can proceed, the French defenders raise the white flag. After a day of negotiations, Louisbourg surrenders to the British on June 17th. The French are allowed to keep their personal belongings, but they're all going to be deported back to France. All told, the French lose around 200 killed and 300 wounded, although the exact number are impossible to tell. The British lose around 170 men, including 30 to disease and 36 lost to Acadian civilians while demolishing fishing villages in the area. It's fortunate for them that the French surrender when they do, at the time of the French surrender, nearly 1,500 men, more than a third of the British force, is too sick with dysentery to fight. John Bradstreet, since promoted to colonel, is given command of the now British-held defenses at Louisbourg. Over the winter of 1745 to 1746, he loses more than 800 men to disease. The French send two fleets to try and take Louisbourg back. One fleet in 1746 is forced to turn back due to foul weather. The other is captured by Commodore Warren's fleet in 1747, a feat for which Warren is knighted. The French will not try to retake Louisbourg again. The the rest of King George's War is the same border war that we already discussed. The French and their Native American allies engage in constant raiding, and the colonists respond by building border forts. In New York in particular, this strategy backfires on the French. Iroquois tribes in upstate New York had remained out of the conflict early on, but constant French and Algonquian raiding pushes them into the conflict. By the end of the war, a colonial army has assembled north of Albany to attack Montreal, and British alloyed Iroquois forces have even moved within sight of the city. When peace comes in Europe in 1748, it also comes to the colonies, at least for the most part. Both sides give up all gains made during the war, and the territorial situation returns to the status quo antebellum. But it leaves a lot of grudges, and not just between the French and the British. The force that took Louisbourg was mostly American, and taking and holding it was a matter of American pride. The British really would have no choice but to return it to the French, as we'll see, but by doing so, it made the Americans feel as if their war contributions didn't matter. So when war comes to North America again in a few years, which it will, the British government won't see the same enthusiastic response from North American colonists, and it will be harder to fight the French. 
It's also worth noting that there will continue to be unrest in the British part of Nova Scotia, even after the War of the Austrian Succession ends. Our friend Jean-Louis Leloutre, the priest who leads the resistance movement, is not a party to the peace treaty, and he will continue to lead a guerrilla resistance until he's captured by the British in 1755. And at that point, the British have had enough, and all of the Acadian people, whether they had participated in the resistance or not, would be forcibly expelled. Anyway, we've talked about one of the two non-European theaters of the war I wanted to talk about. Now let's set our time machines for 1746 and shuffle over to the Indian subcontinent. Now, when most people think of Europeans in India, they think of the British East India Company, the privately owned company that would go on to own much of the subcontinent. And yes, the British East India Company is a powerful force in 1746, but there's also another influential European company in India, the French East India Company. The French and the British each own several settlements on the Indian coast and have been operating factories on the Indian subcontinent for decades. And understand that this isn't colonization by conquest, it's colonization by trade. And as a matter of fact, both the British and French East India companies are operating under the jurisdiction of local rulers at this time. But there are a couple of factors that make them harder to control than your average company. For one thing, the old Mughal Empire, the Islamic gunpowder empire that has ruled India for the last few centuries, is starting to falter. A few decades past, the British East India Company had paid a massive fine to the emperor after some British pirates attacked a Mughal treasure fleet. Now, the local rulers have become more independent, and the British and French are dealing with these local rulers, particularly the Nawab of Arkat, a man named Muhammad Anwaruddin, who rules the Sultanate of Karnataka on the east coast of India. This is where the British and French have set up most of their trading posts, uh, taking advantage of the area's flat land and accessibility, which makes it easy to access all the wealth of India. For another thing, not only is the Mughal Empire beginning to fragment, but both the British and French East India companies are insanely powerful in their own right. Besides tea, which the British East India and Company in particular is notorious for, uh, they also trade in cotton, indigo, porcelain, and silk. These are all lucrative commodities and are either processed in India in company-owned factories or shipped back to the European homeland for processing. We should also understand that while these companies share a lot of the trappings of a modern capitalist company, they're operating in a pre-capitalist system called the mercantile system. Capitalism sometimes sees the world as zero-sum, but companies and even entire countries can have mutually beneficial relationships. Most importantly, one of the core tenets of capitalism is that wealth can be created. And nowadays, we see this as obvious. When someone takes a bunch of aluminum and plastic and forms it into a bicycle, the whole is more than just the sum of its parts. Value has been added. Today's European countries even charge a value-added tax rather than a sales tax. On the other hand, the mercantilist philosophy views wealth as static. If you earn a pound sterling, it's only because somebody else lost one. The goal for mercantilist countries is to maximize exports and minimize imports by charging tariffs on imported goods, and these trade companies have broad discretions as to how they can extract wealth. 
The British and French East India companies have their own mercenary armies and even their own armed sailing ships. And if you're like me, and you're a little bit cynical, you might talk about a company that's powerful enough to own a U.S. senator, but that would be peanuts for these guys. Some of the most powerful leaders in Great Britain are major shareholders, and many British military and political leaders have gotten their start in India. Company influence is less of a problem in France with their absolute monarchy, but the influence is still felt. You can talk all you want about the excessive influence of corporations in modern politics, but this is a whole nother level. Imagine if Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and the Koch brothers were to form a giant conglomerate, then buy out ExxonMobil and Northrop Grumman for good measure, and then imagine that all the company executives are either senators, congress members, or senior military officers. That's what the British East India Company looks like. And again, the French East India Company is a little bit different, but it is still a powerful entity. At this time, the main French settlement in India is at Pondicherry, towards the southern end of the East Indian coast. The main British settlement is at Madras, a little over 90 miles to the north. That's not very far apart, especially in comparison with the total length of the Indian coast, which is quite long. So it is a testament to the commercial nature of these colonial enterprises that war doesn't break out immediately in 1744 when France declares war on Britain. Again, these settlements are awfully close to each other, but instead the British and French East India companies remain at an uneasy peace for two years, until 1746. Any fight between the two risks drawing in local Indian rulers and even losing the right to trade in India altogether. Again, these local rulers in India are still the ones in charge, at least officially, and the companies recognize this. But fighting technically begins in late 1745, when a British naval fleet launches a surprise attack on French ships in a blow against French trade. In response, French Governor Joseph-Francois de Plis sends a message to the homeland asking for help. Louis XV responds by dispatching a fleet under the command of Admiral Bertrand Francois Le Bourdonnais. British Commodore Edward Peyton moves out to intercept them with his fleet, and the two fleets meet on July 6, 1746. The French have nine ships against six British ships, but the French ships aren't fully armed. They'd planned on collecting more cannons at Pondicherry, so the ships aren't carrying as many as they're capable of. And this makes the two fleets more or less evenly matched, and while a few ships are damaged, the outcome of the engagement is indecisive. But the French fleet is able to make it to Pondicherry, where they refit and take on the rest of their cannons. When the two fleets meet again in August, Peyton realizes he's outgunned and pulls the British fleet back north to Bengal. This isn't anywhere near the British settlement at Madras. It is hundreds of miles north. So while the fleet is certainly safe, the British East India Company is now left to its own devices in Madras and the surrounding areas. On September 7th, the French fleet under La Bourdonnais arrives outside of Madras and begins bombarding the city, while de Plise's infantry starts landing on the shore. The British appeal to the Nawab of Arcot, Muhammad Adwaruddin, for assistance. After all, they are in Madras with his permission, and the French are attacking them. But the French offer to return the city to the Nawab outright if they take it. 
and Adwar Odin seized the opportunity to get rid of one colonial power while still reaping the benefits of trading with the other. So he sits by and does nothing. Even so, the British defenders are not terribly concerned. The French cannon fire is inaccurate, and few rounds actually hit Madras's defenses. But on the 8th, the next day, the French fire gets much more accurate. In his book, Clive, The Life and Death of a British Emperor, British historian Robert Harvey writes about the experiences of a young Robert Clive in this battle. Clive would one day work his way up through the ranks of the British East India Company and become one of the most powerful men in India. But for now, he's just a young man who's recently arrived from England seeking his fortune. And Harvey writes about his experiences in the battle. Quote, At dawn, the young riders were woken again by the sound of cannon. This time, sudden explosions just off the fort and within the walls showed that the gunners had found their range. Fire and destruction, although limited, induced panic among the inhabitants of Fort St. George. The offer of Clive, like all his able-bodied companions, to help was gratefully accepted. As the day wore on, men on the battlements, before Clive's eyes, were injured and killed. He saw them borne away on stretchers as he helped to ferry ammunition to the defenders. A total of four Indian and two English soldiers were killed that day, and several more wounded. The garrison seemed incapable of responding to this fire from two sides, land and sea. It had no plan beyond firing back ineffectually. Its commander was an old man. As the relentless, if hardly overwhelming, barrage went on, the soldiers began to abandon their stations and disobey orders. A French shell burst open one of the warehouses containing liquor. The terrified, insubordinate soldiers, always openly despised by their civilian counterparts in times of peace, seized the supplies and began to drink. Clive watched contemptuously with his friends as drunken soldiers roamed the small town, shouting and laughing, and the civilians sheltered indoors. Alcohol and fear had taken over, and the women and children were at risk. The garrison was more of a threat than the French. The pompous, slow pace of this stodgy bourgeois settlement had been shattered in an instant, and a passionate twenty-year-old could not but wonder at the shambles wrought by his superiors coldly gazing upon the worst that can befall any army, in discipline among the troops. The following day, desperate to put an end to the breakdown and order among his own men, Governor Moore sued for peace and secured astonishingly favorable terms for the British. The French would occupy the fort and take over the company's stores, while the English would remain on parole, that is to say, free men. For a ransom still to be agreed, the British would be handed back the town. It was to be a punitive expedition, but no more. Unquote. By allowing the British to keep Madras, La Bourdonnais is being pragmatic. It's not his mission to completely remove the British from Karnataka, only to defend the interests of the French East India Company, which he has done. However, the governor, Dupli, disagrees with this decision, and he leaves a garrison in the city until the end of the war. La Bourdonnais, meanwhile, withdraws his ships back south to Pondicherry, and several are damaged in a storm during the short voyage. By making his deal with the British, though, La Bourdonnais has also gone back on his word to Muhammad Anwaruddin to give Madras back to the Sultanate of Karnataka, which damages Anwaruddin's trust in the French. So he goes ahead and dispatches a force of 10,000 troops under the command of his own son to take Fort St. George, the main British fortification that the French have taken over, well, he's going to take it by force. But 
Duplee, who is holding the fort, uh, while he's not going along with La Bourdonnais' deal to give the fort back to the British, he's not going to give it back to Carnatica either. He is going to expand French power, and he calls in reinforcements to cut off the Indian troops. The French are able to field 350 European soldiers as well as 700 local Indian troops who are equipped with modern weapons, all of them infantry, using the latest European volley fire tactics. Meanwhile, the Carnatic forces are made up almost entirely of Mughal cavalry. But it has been a long time since the Mughal Empire has faced a serious outside power. Most of the action the Mughal armies have seen for the past several generations have been local Indian rebels. So while their technology isn't out of date so much, their tactics haven't evolved in years, and faced by European volley fire, the Sultan's army is forced to withdraw. But while this is going on, Dupli has just about drained the French garrison at Madras, And in the absence of a significant number of guards, some of the British prisoners managed to escape, including our friend the young Robert Clive. They disguise themselves as local Indians and make their way south along the coast, past the French settlement at Pondicherry to the British outpost of Fort St. David. And they bring news that the French have taken Madras. And this gives the British time to call in reinforcements to Fort St. David and to withstand repeated attacks over the next two years. In fact, by the end of the war, in late 1748, the British will be on the offensive, moving out of Fort St. David and putting Pondicherry itself under siege. But they will be forced to withdraw in October with the arrival of monsoon season around the time the War of the Austrian Succession ends. It won't be until December 1748 that the news of the end of the war arrives from Europe. As with many British colonists in the Americas, Duplee and many of the French in India are upset with the peace treaty. France will return Madras to the British in exchange for the British returning Louisbourg to the French in the Americas. It's a logical agreement for both countries. If the French get to keep Madras, they get a monopoly on trade from the Sultanate of Karnataka and maybe eventually on all of India, so the British really, really want Madras back. The British get to keep Louisbourg, they are poised to shut off access to the St. Lawrence River in any future war in the Americas. So the French really, really want Louisbourg back. It makes sense for both countries to give back what they've taken in order to regain what they've lost. But tell that to a militiaman from Massachusetts who watched his brother get scalped or a Frenchman who lost his arm fighting in India. To those people, this war looks terribly pointless. It feels like your mother country has betrayed you. And speaking of the mother country, we left off last episode in 1745. There's still three years of fighting left to go in the War of the Austrian Succession, so let's get back to Europe. And actually, we don't have too much to talk about there, because while there are several battles and sieges, there's no there there, if you get my meaning. Nothing really decisive happens. That's not to say that nothing happens at all, though. So before we talk about the peace treaty, which is the most important part of this war... Let's quickly go over the last few years of what has been happening in Europe. In 1745, the Franco-Spanish coalition, which includes the Republic of Genoa, is curb-stomping the Austrian coalition, which includes the Kingdom of Piedmont-Sardinia. But that's where we left off. And as you'll recall, Maria Theresa has just made peace with Frederick the Great, so... Germany is now at peace, 
And now the Austrians can redeploy all of those forces that have been tied up fighting the Prussians, and most of those troops are sent to northern Italy. By the end of 1746, the Austrians have liberated their own territory, but have failed to conquer Genoa and push west over the Alps into France. For the next two years, the war in northern Italy is stalled out around Genoa, and neither side is able to gain a decisive advantage. And this is yar largely thanks to the hilly terrain, which makes ground easier to defend and harder to attack. There's a lot of choke points. You can set up defensive positions. The hillier the terrain, the stronger the defensive advantage, and this front just stalls out. On the Netherlands, on the other hand, the terrain is relatively open, defended by huge fortress complexes instead. And in this open ground siege warfare, things have been going worse for the Austrians. Because of the Jacobite Rebellion, the British are forced to ship their troops back to Britain in 1745, which allows the French to make significant gains. And over the next few years, the French army slowly creeps forward through this very heavily fortified country, destroying fortress after fortress. And by late 1748, the Austrian Netherlands have been almost entirely conquered. The French have even taken a couple of the border fortresses between the Austrian Netherlands, modern-day Belgium, and the Dutch Republic, the modern-day Netherlands. The Austrians have one last card to play, though, and it's the one they've been threatening to play throughout the war, but haven't really been able to. In the spring of 1748, Maria Theresa finally convinces her Russian allies to send troops. She's even convinced the British and Dutch to fund this army, and the Russians dispatch 30,000 troops to fight the French. The problem is that this army has to march over land across most of Europe to actually get to the Rhine River Valley and engage the French. So it's going to take some time, and understand that right now all of the belligerent powers are exhausted. The War of the Austrian Succession has been going on for eight years, and it's expensive. The French are doing great on the European continent from a military perspective, but the treasury is almost empty, and a British blockade is threatening to bankrupt them. Never mind the incoming army of fresh, unbloodied Russians. The Spanish aren't doing much better financially, and the campaign in northern Italy has turned into a stalemate. Even the British Treasury is strained from constantly funding all of their allies. The Dutch are losing their border fortresses. Everybody is losing thousands of men in battle every year, with many more civilians dying from war-related food shortages. At this point, everybody wants to make peace except for Maria Theresa, who wants to keep fighting until she has regained all of her lost territories. Ultimately, it's not up to Maria Theresa. See, way back in August of 1746, the British and French had decided that the War of the Austrian Succession had turned into a Franco-British proxy war, and this was a war that neither side wanted. So, Diplomats from both sides met at the Dutch city of Breda to negotiate a peace settlement. These peace talks would go on for more than two years as each side tried to gain an advantage. But in April of 1748, they come to a secret peace agreement. And on no October 18th, 1748, the British, French, and the Dutch Republic signed the Treaty of Aix la Chapelle, officially declaring a peace treaty between the three countries. The British and the French then go to their allies and give them the choice to sign the treaty or not. And in reality, this is not much of a choice. 
it would be ludicrous for the Austrians or Spanish to keep fighting alone without their allies, let alone for the smaller powers of Genoa and Piedmont Sardinia to even consider continuing the fight. Austria, Spain, and Piedmont Sardinia signed the treaty in December, and Genoa signs it in January of 1749. For all of the fighting that's happened, the Treaty of Isla Chapelle doesn't change much. As I already discussed, the French and British each give back the colonial territories they've taken, reverting to the pre-war status quo. France also returns the Dutch border forts and withdraws from the Austrian Netherlands. Austria cedes a few small Italian duchies to Spain, in return for which all parties to the treaty agree to recognize Maria Theresa as the lawful ruler of all the other Habsburg lands. The biggest beneficiary of the treaty is someone who doesn't even sign it, Frederick the Great, the King of Prussia. In the treaty, all parties acknowledge his conquest of Silesia as legitimate, and Maria Theresa gives up any claim to the territory. For those of you who didn't listen to the last two episodes, Silesia is a large, wealthy area in east-central Germany, modern-day Poland, and uh, Prussia itself is a small territory on the Baltic, but by combining Silesia with that, as well as Frederick's already powerful electorate of Brandenburg, that's where Berlin is, all of a sudden with these lands, Frederick has forged a new, powerful country in Central Europe. And this is something Maria Theresa could never accept over the long term. When the British ambassador requests a meeting to celebrate the peace treaty, she says, quote, a visit of condolences would be more proper under these circumstances than one of congratulation. The British minister will oblige me by making no allusion whatever to so disagreeable a topic. Unquote. The relationship between Britain and Austria slowly turns sour. At the same time, the alliance between Prussia and France is also fraying. Frederick the Great has behaved dishonorably, and if you remember from the last two episodes, he made a separate peace with the Austrians not once, but twice. But the old alliance system from before the war is falling apart, and countries are starting to look for new allies. This is happening in the aftermath of a war that left a lot of issues unresolved, and it's a scary time, but it's also a dynamic one. Historians call this European political realignment the diplomatic revolution. In his book, History of the Habsburg Empire, 19th century American historian John S. C. Abbott describes it mostly from the Austrian point of view. This is a long quote with several subquotes, but it's more colorful than any description I can give, and the book has been in the public domain for at least 50 years, so I will just read it. Abbott writes, quote, The Queen was not only well aware that this peace could not long continue, but was fully resolved that it should not be permanent. Her great rival, Frederick, had wrested from her Silesia, and she was determined that there should be no stable peace until she had regained it. With wonderful energy, she availed herself of this short respite in replenishing her treasury and in recruiting her armies. Frederick himself has recorded the masculine vigor with which she prepared herself for the renewal of war. Maria Theresa, he says, in the secrecy of her cabinet, arranged those great projects which she afterwards carried into execution. She introduced an order and economy into the finances unknown to her ancestors, and her revenues far exceeded those of her father, even when he was master of Naples, Parma, Silesia, and Servia. Having learned the necessity of introducing into her army a better discipline, she annually formed camps in the provinces, which she visited herself, that she might animate the troops by her presence and bounty. She established a military academy at Vienna, 
and it collected the most skillful professors of all the sciences and exercises which tend to elucidate or improve the art of war. By these institutions the army acquired, under Maria Theresa, such a degree of perfection as it had never attained under any one of her predecessors, and a woman accomplished the designs worthy of a great man. The queen immediately organized a standing army of 108,000 men, who were brought under the highest state of discipline, and were encamped in such positions that they could, at any day, be concentrated ready for combined action. The one great object which now seemed to engross her mind was the recovery of Silesia. It was, of course, a subject not to be spoken of openly, but in secret confidence with her ministers, she unfolded her plans and sought counsel. Her intense devotion to political affairs, united to a mind of great activity and native strength, soon placed her above her ministers in intelligence and sagacity. And conscious of superior powers, she leaned less upon them and relied upon her own resources. With the judgment thus matured, she became convinced of the incapacity of her cabinet, and with great skill in the discernment of character, chose Count Kaunitz, who was then her ambassador at Paris, as prime minister. Kaunitz, son of the governor of Moravia, had given signal proof of his diplomatic abilities, in Rome and in Paris. For nearly forty years he remained at the head of foreign affairs, and, in conjunction with the queen, administered the government of Austria. Policy had for some time allied Austria and England, but there had never been any real friendship between the two cabinets. The high tone of superiority ever assumed by the court of St. James, its offensive declaration that the arm of England alone had saved the house of Austria from utter ruin, and the imperious demand for corresponding gratitude annoyed and exasperated the proud court of Vienna. The British cabinet were frequently remonstrated with against the assumption of such airs, and the employment of language so haughty in their diplomatic intercourse. But the British government has never been celebrated for courtesy in its intercourse with weaker powers. The Chancellor Konitz entreated them in their communications to respect the sex and temper of the Queen, and not to irritate her by demeanor so overbearing. The Emperor himself entered a remonstrance against the discourtesy which characterized their intercourse. Even the Queen, unwilling to break off friendly relations with her unpolished allies, complained to the British or ambassador of the arrogant style of the English documents. They do not, said the Queen, disturb me, but they give great offense to others and endanger the amity existing between the two nations. I would wish that more courtesy might mark our intercourse. But the amenities of Polish life the rude islanders despised. The British ambassador at Vienna, Sir Robert Keith, a gentlemanly man, was often mortified at the messages he was compelled to communicate to the Queen. Occasionally the messages were couched in terms so peremptory and offensive that he could not summon resolution to deliver them. And thus, he more than once incurred the censure of the king and cabinet for his sense of propriety and delicacy. These remonstrances were all unavailing, and at length the Austrian cabinet began to reply with equal rancor. This state of things led the Austrian cabinet to turn to France and seek the establishment of friendly relations with that court. Louis XV, the most miserable of debauchés, was nominally king. His mistress, Jeannette Poisson, who was as thoroughly polluted as her regal paramour, governed the monarch, and through him, France. The king had ennobled her with the title of Marchioness of Pompadour. Her power was so boundless and indisputable that the most illustrious ladies of the French court were happy to serve as her waiting women. Whenever she walked out, one of the highest nobles of the realm accompanied her as her attendant, obsequiously bearing her shawl upon his arm to spread it over her shoulders in case it should be needed. Ambassadors and ministers she summoned before her, assuming that air of royalty which she had purchased with her merchantable charms. Voltaire, Diderot, Montesquieu waited in her antechambers and implored her patronage. The haughty mistress became even weary of their adulation. 
Not only, said she one day to the Abbe de Bernie, have I all the nobility at my feet, but even my lapdog is weary of their fawning. With many apologies for requiring of the high-minded Maria Theresa a sacrifice, Conitz suggested to her the expediency of cultivating the friendship of Pompadour. Silesia was engraved upon the heart of the queen, and she was prepared to do anything which could aid her in the reconquest of that duchy. She stooped so low as to write a letter with her own hand to the marchioness, addressing her as our dear friend and cousin. This was a new triumph for Pompadour, and it delighted her beyond measure. To have the most illustrious sovereign of Europe, combining in her person the titles of Queen of Austria and Empress of Germany, solicit her friendship and her good offices, so excited the vanity of the mistress that she became immediately the warm friend of Maria Theresa and her all-powerful advocate in the court of Versailles. England was now becoming embroiled with France in reference to the possessions upon the St. Lawrence and Ohio in North America. In case of war, France would immediately make an attack upon Hanover. England was anxious to assure the Austrian alliance that the armies of the Queen might aid in the protection of Hanover. But Austria, being now in secret conference with France, was very reserved. England coaxed and threatened, but could get no definite or satisfactory answer. Quite enraged, the British cabinet sent a final declaration that, should the empress decline fulfilling the conditions required, the king cannot take any measures in cooperation with Austria, and the present system of European policy must be dissolved. The reply of the Empress Queen develops the feeling of irritation and bitterness which at that time existed between the two cabinets of Austria and England. The Queen, Maria Theresa replied, has never had the satisfaction of seeing England do justice to her principles. If the army of Austria were merely the hired soldiers of England, the British cabinet could not more decisively assume the control of their movements than it now does by requiring their removal from the center of Austria for the defense of England and Hanover. We are reproached with the great efforts England has made in behalf of the House of Austria. But to these efforts, England owes its present greatness. If Austria has derived useful succors from England, she has purchased those succors with the blood and ruin of her subjects, while England has been opening to herself new sources of wealth and power. We regret the necessity of uttering these truths in reply to unjust and unceasing reproaches. Could any consideration diminish our gratitude towards England, it would be thus diminished by her constant endeavor to represent the aid she has furnished us as entirely gratuitous, when this aid has always been, and always will be, dictated by her own interests. Such goading as this brought back a roar. The British envoy was ordered to demand an explicit and categorical reply to the following questions. 1. If the French attack Hanover, will the Queen render England assistance? 2. What number of troops will she send, and how soon will they be in motion to join the British and Hanoverian troops? The Austrian minister, Konitz, evaded a reply, coldly answering, our ultimatum has been given. The Queen deems those declarations as ample as can be expected in the present posture of affairs, nor can she give any further reply until England shall have more fully explained her intentions. Thus repulsed, England turned to Prussia and sought alliance with the most inveterate enemy of Austria. Frederick, fearing an assault from united Russia and Austria, eagerly entered into friendly relations with England, and on the 16th of January, 1756, entered into a treaty with the Cabinet of Great Britain for the defense of Hanover. Maria Theresa was quite delighted with this arrangement, for affairs were moving much to her satisfaction at Versailles. Her dear friend and cousin, Jeanette Poisson, had dismissed all the ministers who were unfriendly to Austria, and replaced them with her own creatures who were in favor of the Austrian alliance. A double motive influenced the Marchioness of Pompadour. Her vanity was gratified by the advances of Maria Theresa, 
and revenge roused her soul against Frederick of Prussia, who had indulged in a cutting witticism upon her position and character. The Marchioness, with one of her favorites, Cardinal Berni, met the Austrian ambassador in one of the private apartments of the Palace of the Luxembourg, and arranged the plan of the alliance between France and Austria. Maria Theresa, without the knowledge of her ministers or even of her husband the Emperor, privately conducted these negotiations with the Marchioness de Pompadour. Mr. Konitz was the agent employed by the Queen in this transaction. Louis XV, sunk in the lowest depths of debauchery, consented to any arrangements his mistress might propose. But when the treaty was all matured, it became necessary to present it to the Council of State. The Queen, knowing how astounded her husband would be to learn what she had been doing, and aware of the shock it would give the ministry to think of an alliance with a France, pretended to entire ignorance of the measures she had been so energetically prosecuting. In very guarded and apologetic phrase, Konitz introduced the delicate subject. The announcement of the unexpected alliance with France struck all with astonishment and indignation. Francis, vehemently moved, rose and smiting the table with his hand exclaimed, Such an alliance is unnatural and impracticable. It shall never take place. The empress, by nods and winks, encouraged her minister, and he went on detailing the great advantages to result from the French alliance. Maria Theresa listened with great attention to his arguments and was apparently convinced by them. She then gave her approbation so decisively as to silence all debate. She said that such a treaty was so manifestly for the interest of Austria that she was fearful that France would not accede to it. Since she knew that the matter was already arranged and settled with the French court, this was a downright lie, though the Queen probably regarded it as a venial fib, or as diplomacy. Thus, curiously, England and Austria had changed their allies. George II and Frederick II, from being rancorous foes, became friends, and Maria Theresa and Louis XV unfurled their flags together. England was indignant with Austria for the French alliance. Austria was indignant with England for the Prussian alliance. Each accused the other of being the first to abandon the ancient treaty. As the British ambassador reproached the Queen with this abandonment, she replied, I have not abandoned the old system, but Great Britain has abandoned me and that system by concluding the Prussian treaty, the first intelligence of which struck me like a fit of apoplexy. I and the King of Prussia are incompatible. No consideration on earth shall induce me to enter into any engagement to which he is a party. Why should you be surprised if, following your example and concluding a treaty with Prussia, I should enter into an engagement with France? I have but two enemies, Maria Theresa said again, whom I have to dread, the King of Prussia and the Turks. And while I and the Empress of Russia continue on the same good terms as now subsist between us, we shall, I trust, be able to convince Europe that we are in a condition to defend ourselves against those adversaries, however formidable. The Queen still kept her eye anxiously fixed upon Silesia, and in secret combination with the Empress of Russia made a preparation for a sudden invasion. With as much secrecy as was possible, Large armies were congregated in the vicinity of Prague, while Russia was cautiously concentrating her troops upon the frontiers of Livonia. But Frederick was on the alert, and immediately demanded of the Empress Queen the significance of these military movements. In the present crisis, the Queen replied, I deem it necessary to take measures for the security of myself and my allies, which tend to the prejudice of no one. So vague an answer was, of course, unsatisfactory, and the haughty Prussian king reiterated his demand in very imperious tones. I wish, said he, for an immediate and categorical answer, not delivered in an oracular style, ambiguous and inconclusive, respecting the armaments in Bohemia, 
and I demand a positive assurance that the Queen will not attack me either during this year or the following year. Unquote. And if that sounds like the beginning of another war, it is. It's the Seven Years' War, which breaks out in 1756. But that's a story for next episode. At the same time, it's hard not to think of these two wars as being one and the same. The War of the Austrian Succession resolves nothing, stirs up the existing alliance systems, and creates chaos not just in Europe, but in India and the Americas. In some ways, these two wars are analogous to World War I and World War II. World War I shakes up Europe and the world and leaves changes in its wake, but the main issues are never resolved. And soon you end up with a repeat with slightly different alliances. At the end of the War of the Austrian Succession, Britain and France are more at odds than ever over their colonial possessions. There will be blood again, both in North America and in India. Both sides know this, and both know it's just a matter of time. But in the interwar period, the British improved their position. In the Americas, British diplomats push for improved ties with the Iroquois Confederacy. In 1754, the colonies of Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island send delegates to a meeting in Albany, New York. The delegates from these seven colonies meet with representatives from the six nations of the Iroquois Confederacy and agree to a formal alliance, with the colonists recognizing the Confederacy's sovereignty over all the lands between the Hudson and Mississippi rivers. Benjamin Franklin actually attends this conference and asks the Iroquois delegates many questions about their system of government. This may ultimately end up influencing the writing of the American Constitution. But the main result of this conference is that the French aren't the only Europeans with close, strong alliances with Native American tribes anymore. And in the next war those alliances are going to be crucial. In India, meanwhile, the war barely ends at all. In 1749, the French East India Company tries to overthrow the Nawab of Arcot, Muhammad Anwaruddin, who you'll recall is now friendly with the British East India Company. Anwaruddin is killed in battle against the French and their local allies, led by Anwaruddin's French-backed rival Nasir Jung. But in 1751, Robert Clive, our young protagonist from the Siege of Madras, leads an attack on Arcot itself and captures the city for the British. The French and Nasir Jung are unable to force them out, and in 1754, the parties sign a treaty recognizing Muhammad Anwaruddin's pro-British son, Muhammad Ali Khan Walaja, as the new Nawab. The French governor, Joseph-Francois Duplis, is personally bankrupted by this Second Carnatic War and returns to France to live out his days in abject poverty. If anything, the British position in India is stronger than ever. And while you've got all this tension between the British and French, don't forget that there's still tension between the British and Spanish. And of course, you've got Maria Theresa and the Russian Empress Elizabeth Petronova ready to pounce on Frederick the Great. So there are all kinds of places where a powder keg could go off and start the next war. In many ways, the War of the Austrian Succession lays the groundwork for the first true world war, the Seven Years' War. And that's why it's relevant.
Hello again. It's me, Dan. This is a friendly reminder that if you're only listening to the audio podcast, you're not getting all of my content. I also have a Patreon channel called Dan's War College. Each month, I break down a historical battle, weapon, or tactic and explain how it works. This is a video series with maps, graphics, and other helpful visual aids, and you can get it all for just $5 a month. We've done 10 episodes so far, and some of these have even been patron requests, because I do take requests. You can find the link to the Patreon channel in the episode description. And if you're on the fence, episode 5 of Dan's War College is currently publicly available, so you can check that one out and get a taste for what the channel is like. Of course, not everybody wants to spend $5 a month for a monthly video, and who can blame you? There are so many channels and subscription services out there that it's just impossible to sign up for all of them. But if you still want to support the show, you can share it with your friends or post a link on social media. Shows like this grow by word of mouth. And if the channel's growth is any indication, you guys are great advertisers. Thanks so much, and please keep it up. And if your podcast service lets you leave a review, please do so. If you want to follow Relevant History on social media, you can find links in the description for that as well. Or just go to Twitter and find at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast. If you want to send me an email, you can write to Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast at gmail.com. Tell me what you liked, or if you think I got something wrong, tell me that too. You can also visit the show's website at dantollerpodcast.com. Once again, that's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.